Welcome to the first immunology tutorial. My name is Alex and today we'll be going through a couple of topics covering major histocompatibility complex molecules or MHC and T cells. To go through T cells though, we need to first talk about dendritic cells. Next, I will briefly go through the MHC genes and antigen processing. Third, we'll be going through the dendritic cell maturation process and have a discussion of PAMPs. Finally, we will get to antigen presentation leading to T cell activation and how T helper cells differentiate to perform their various roles in the immune response. The immune system is divided into the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. Dendritic cells are members of the innate immune system but serve as an important link between the two. Dendritic cells, or DC for the shorthand, are what's called antigen presenting cells or APCs and these reside in peripheral tissues like the skin and in their immature state are very good at taking up or endocytosing antigens in their environment. But to present these antigens to T cells of the adaptive immune response, these antigens need to first bind molecules called major histocompatibility molecules. There are two classes of MHC, MHC1 and MHC2, which bind to antigens that are composed of peptides. These MHC differ based on which peptides combine with them and the types of T cells that can recognize them. MHC1 are found on all nucleated cells and present cytosolic antigens. These are antigens found inside the cell. MHC2 are found only on professional antigen presenting cells like this dendritic cell, but also macrophages and B cells and these present endosomal antigens. These are antigens that were originally extracellular but have been taken up by the cell. In this instance, peptide antigens that are endocytosed by the dendritic cell are processed within the cell and then form a complex in vesicles containing MHC class II molecules. This complex of MHC and peptide antigen are then transported to the cell surface and expressed. In their original immature state, Dendritic cells are very good at taking up and processing antigens, but they're not great at presenting and activating T cells. So what needs to happen is for the dendritic cell to receive a signal from the environment that there is an infection or there's inflammation occurring. Dendritic cells respond quickly to these signals because they're equipped with pattern recognition receptors or PRRs. Pattern recognition receptors respond to conserved molecular patterns shared amongst groups of microorganisms. These are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, commonly known as PAMs. For example, if a gram-negative bacteria invades the area, within the cell membrane of the bacteria is a molecule called lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. Now, lipopolysaccharide is a potent PAMP, and it's found in all gram-negative bacteria. So LPS from the bacterial outer membrane can then bind the PRR on a dendritic cell. In this case, the PRR is toll-like receptor 4. Once this happens, the dendritic cell matures and prepares to present antigens to T cells. So peptide antigens from the invading bacteria, which were originally extracellular, are endocytosed by the dendritic cell, they combine with the MHC class 2, and then are presented on the cell surface. In addition, part of the process includes upregulating co-stimulatory molecules on the cell surface. Now these are really important and we will come to them a bit later, but for now, just know them as CD80, 86. Normally dendritic cells are anchored to their environment, so part of the process is down-regulating adhesion molecules to allow dendritic cells to migrate to lymph nodes, where they can then activate T cells. So what we have now is a mature dendritic cell that is drained to a lymph node. It is expressing MHC class 2 complex with bacterial peptide antigen. It is also expressing this special marker CD8086. 
Now I've already discussed some of the differences between the MHC molecules, but another important distinction is the different T cells they stimulate. There are two T cell types, based on which accessory molecule they each express. T cells that express CD4 are called T helper cells, and these respond specifically to MHC class 2. T cells that express CD8 are called cytotoxic T cells and respond to MHC class 1. CD4 T cells are thought of as helper cells because they assist many other immune cell types, particularly via cytokine release, and therefore indirectly eliminate pathogens. We will be focusing on this particular T cell. CD4 positive T cells have a T cell receptor that recognizes and binds to a combination of MHC class 2 and peptide antigen. Each T cell expresses one type of T cell receptor, which is specific for a particular combination of MHC and peptide. CD4 is the accessory molecule that also binds to part of the MHC class 2 molecule. But this interaction is not enough to activate a T cell, and in fact, there are three signals required to activate T cells. The important second signal is co stimulation, which is mediated by CD8086 on dendritic cells, which bind CD28 on T cells. This acts as a safety check for the immune system. For if the dendritic cell does not express this molecule as a result of infection, the T cell won't be activated by the MHC molecule with peptide alone. So we have signal 1, which is the MHC peptide combination ligating the specific T cell receptor. And signal 2, which is CD8086 on dendritic cells binding CD28 on T cells to provide co-stimulation. This third signal are cytokines released by dendritic cells. These cytokines will induce the T helper cell to differentiate into the appropriate subclass, which will help shape the immune response to suit the invading microbe. For this schematic of T cell differentiation, we first have cytokines in the microenvironment that will induce CD4 positive T cells to switch into the appropriate subclass. Each T cell subset will produce its own signature cytokines which will result in a specific response by the immune system. If we first look at this separate diagram, we can see how the cytokines produced by the dendritic cell or other inflammatory cells dictates the T cell response and therefore the downstream consequences. If interleukin-12 is released, this causes CD4 positive T cells to differentiate into T helper 1 cells. But if interleukin-4 stimulates the T cell, they will turn into Th2 cells. The Th1 cell will itself produce interferon gamma. The Th2 cell will itself produce interleukin-4. So back to the schematic. As described before, interleukin-12 in the environment will cause T cells to differentiate into Th1 subset. They can produce interferon gamma as well as TNF alpha. These have two functions. They activate macrophages to help with responses to intracellular pathogens, and they also cause B cells to isotype switch their antibodies to IgG. Interleukin-4 will lead to differentiation into Th2 cells. These are heavily implicated in allergic responses as well as parasitic responses by releasing interleukin-4, as well as interleukin-5 and interleukin-13. Interleukin-4 stimulates B cells to isotype switch to IgE, which will bind to and sensitize mast cells. Another subset are Th17 cells, which are induced by interleukin-6 or TGF-beta. Th17 produces interleukin-17, which helps responses to extracellular pathogens by recruiting neutrophils. Another pathway is when TGF-beta stimulates T cells, which is different to the other ones in that it produces a regulatory T cell via upregulation of a FOXP3 transcription factor. V cells produce TGF-beta or interleukin-10 and help regulate and suppress the immune system. That concludes the tutorial. Thank you for joining me. And if you enjoyed this video, please check out some of our other tutorials on our channel.